can hear me. Okay, great. Okay, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. What a, what a terrific uh, panel. Uh, it's great to follow Victoria and uh, Ross and, uh, and of course, Jean, who has been such a fantastic ally, uh, both in the work of uh, the task force and then in making this revolution in the way that we deal with uh, social uh, issues, including within that environmental issues, making that uh, revolution happen. And uh, the task force was a great uh, revelation, I think, for all of us who are interested in trying to uh, solve some of society's critical problems, because it brought together, over a period uh, that continues now into its second year, over 200 people across the G7 countries, uh, Australia, and uh, the EU. And it was remarkable to see that across all of these different countries, you've got the same issues. You've got governments that are staring at a yawning gap uh, between uh, the amount of money that they are planning to spend to tackle social issues and the need for social issues. You've got investors, as uh, we were hearing in the previous panel, who want to do more with their money than just achieve a financial return. $56 trillion worth of assets have signed up to the United Nations principles of responsible investment. And you've got entrepreneurs who want to do more meaningful things than just make money. They want to try to tackle uh, some of society's major issues. And it's been uh, a paradox uh, that over the last century or so, uh, we've been able to fund businesses and we've improved the ways that we fund them through venture capital, through the creation of stock markets like NASDAQ in the case of the United States and so on. And yet, we've not been able to fund entrepreneurs who wanted to improve the lives of others in the same way. And in many ways, the characteristic of the social sector, I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with it. By social sector, I mean uh, not for profits. The characteristic of the social sector is that uh, nobody has any money and virtually no one has scale. And the reason has uh, had to do uh, with the way that philanthropy has uh, funded not for profits. In the absence of measurement, philanthropy has said we will give you money for two or three years, and then as a sanity check, go raise money from somebody else. And by the way, don't spend any money on your overheads. So the result is that in the United States over 25 years, you've seen Dan Pelota's presentation, uh, I'm sure, uh, 50,000 businesses made it through $50 million of sales, and just 144 not-for-profits did. So why, why is the revolution happening now? The revolution is happening now because a watershed has been crossed in measuring social outcomes. We used to think that nothing social could be measured. And in fact, what we're beginning to discover, as Jean was uh, saying through the social impact bond in the first place, is there are a lot of social issues where you can measure an improvement very accurately. When in the UK we launched the first social impact bond in 2010 to help prisoners of Peterborough Prison who, like many others across the world and the United States included, have two-thirds of them going back to jail within 18 months of, uh, of, of release. A lot of people said social impact bonds will work only for prisoners. And the bond, by the way, for those of you who are not familiar with it, basically is an agreement with government that investors put their money up, say it's a five-year bond or a seven-year bond, and if they manage to achieve an improvement, in this case we had to achieve more than a 7.5% reduction in the rate of reoffending, then the government pays the money back, £5 million in the case of the Peterborough bond, and an increased rate of interest, increasing rate of interest, which went from 2 to 13% in the case of uh, the first one, and looks like uh, giving investors a 7% uh, return. And if you fail to beat those benchmarks, then it was a philanthropic donation. 
People said at the time, uh, you're only going to deal with prisoners. The latest bond happens to have been in Chicago. Rahm Emanuel issued a $17 million bond to deal with the education of children from difficult backgrounds from age four upwards. There's been in the United States, in Massachusetts, a $28 million social impact bond to deal with hopeless, homelessness. In the UK, there are 15 social impact bonds. They're dealing with adoption, with foster parentage, with the training of unemployed uh, youth, uh, and on and on. Uh, in Australia, they have two social impact bonds dealing with difficult families. And as a result of the realization that measurement is possible, government has begun in different countries to make public the information about the cost of social issues. You can go to the web now, the cabinet office site in the UK, and you can see the cost of 600 social issues. A kid that's taken into care costs 63,000 pounds, 100,000 dollars a year. A prisoner who reoffends costs 22,000 pounds, 30,000 dollars a year, and on and on and on. And this has given us an understanding now that we can actually set social and financial objectives at the same time. And it's brought us to the realization that if in the 19th century investors talked about financial return, and if in the 20th century they talk of risk and return, then in the 21st century we're going to talk about risk, return and impact. And the reason is that we can measure impact. Now, the forces driving this forward are government on the one hand, investors and entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes, as we all know, in the United States better than anyone else. Some entrepreneurs want to use not-for-profit models, as we heard. Usually, through the work of the task force we've discovered, because the issues they're dealing with are issues that require the help of the community. And it's much easier to get the help of the community if you're a not-for-profit than if you're in it to make, uh, to, to make uh, money. Other entrepreneurs want to use the power of cash flow generation and the growth of, of, uh, of a market in order to improve people's lives. But the difference between impact investment and investment with impact is that in impact investment, you set objectives that are both financial and social, including environmental. And you measure the achievement of both. It's doing good and doing well at the same time. When Mr. Anderson asked this question about impact, investment with impact is the investment of a corporation that does good along the way, but no objectives are set and nothing is measured. And in our view, the revolution is going to come from organizations that set objectives, ambitious objectives. And investment committees across the world are going to look at propositions that say, we can give you a 15% net IRR, but we can also achieve a 25% social, invest a social return on the investment, because we're going to rehabilitate a thousand kids who otherwise would have gone back to jail, and it's costing the state $30,000 each. And for those who believe that these are marginal issues, when Janet Yellen made a speech a few months ago, she said, those in employment in the United States, able-bodied men, have fallen from 98% of the population to 91% of the population of the able-bodied men. And the main reason is prisons, the prison population and the difficulty for prisoners to get into jobs. So we're not talking of tackling marginal issues. We're talking of tackling fundamental issues economically for the country and, of course, for the people whose lives are, are ruined uh, by uh, these, uh, these problems. So we are moving away from a slogan, which was the slogan of equality of opportunity, which turned out to be an empty phrase if you were born in the wrong family, to tools that can now attract very significant investment. We can now connect social entrepreneurs with the capital markets. And previously, we were unable to do this. In the United States, as Gene was saying, you need changes in regulation. 
One of them is the changes in the ERISA legislation, which was so important for venture capital. Another one is the way in which government commissions uh, social services. And the third one is the duties of foundation trustees who have to get away from the thought that they've got to keep their endowments separate from their grant activity to embracing mission-related investment and getting to allocations. Now, the good news is that from an investment point of view, we're building something that's akin to a new asset class that can deliver uncorrelated returns through social impact bonds and so on of 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 percent and down the line that you can imagine going into every one of the asset classes. You can imagine impact public equities, impact fixed income, impact private equity, impact uh, uh, real estate, impact venture capital. And so if you can manage to improve your financial return, improve the diversification of your, of your portfolio at the cost of a loss of liquidity, because most most of uh, the absolute return part of the portfolio, like social impact bonds, is, is, is illiquid. That's well worth doing. That's in the interest of endowments, as well as institutional investors. Now, where all of you in the room are concerned is around the issue of social entrepreneurs who are using for-profit models. The development of the B Corp in the United States is a major watershed it's moved into Latin America, we're bringing it into the UK. We want to lock in the social mission of businesses. And if we're able to do that, then I think that we will look back on this period and say venture capital responded to the needs of tech entrepreneurs, impact investment responds to the needs of social entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Ronald, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid we have no time for questions because we have a congressman in waiting uh, on a tight schedule. But thank you so much for making the effort to be with us and for your remarks. Appreciate My pleasure. it. Great to be with you. Yeah.